Hey, good morning, everybody. Uh, yesterday was one of the, the big days where we do the top out processing, so I'm sure you guys might have some questions. Uh, feel free to um, post questions in the chat or, you know, turn your mic on, share your screen, and we can walk through some stuff together. Hello, good morning. May I start? <laughs> yeah, go for it. Okay, so I downloaded two sites uh, from Sentinel-1 from the um, Turkey Syria earthquake that happened this year. Mm -hmm. So I have two images. May, may I share a screen? Yeah, go for it. Okay. Okay, so um, just in case, this is the area. Um, just wanted to um, remember that here's the, the lake because I have some weird results from the geocoding. I mean, maybe I just probably don't understand something, but my results is kind of like a swap. I will get there. Um, and then I found some, you know, information from the ESA, how the results show up. So, mm -hmm. um, so I process all three SWATs. So this is the third one. And here's the lake, mm -hmm. which, you know, and uh, so this is the step 3.10 geocoding, which kind of like shows me the flip results. So this is, for example, then, uh, yeah, with the top of face, the filtered stuff. So here's the lake and the stuff been going on here. Mm -hmm. um, so this is another swap. Again, it's, it's all the geocoded results are like, you know, Flipped, although the coordinates go in the proper way, and this is and this is um SWOT number one. No, this yeah, this is number one. So um, I don't know why they are all like flipped, or I don't understand the geocoding properly. You want to flip back to the map again? I just need to. Um... Maybe it's, okay. So here's a map. Okay. And maybe okay. And where is that lake that you pointed to uh, in your it's interface? Here and okay, it's there. My, my interface is here. I mean, unless this goes the other direction. I, I think you know probably the best thing to do would download this interfere gram the files associated with it and try and open it up into something like qgis so you can check out the geocoding on top of a base map um so the extension is geo um can i open this in arcgis so you can't open that file basically the geo files are binary files but there, if you look in that same directory there will be ones that have basically the same name, but then a .vrt extension, I believe. Oh, okay, okay, okay. And yes, if you download VRT. both of those, yeah, if you download both those files together and click on the vrt option, when... So this will be like, this and that one. So I have to, do you see? Yep. So yeah, I if have you have download, download both of those. those. Okay, and then I'll be open this in ArcMap? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and then you click on the vrt file to open. When you do that. Okay, great. I'll try to open it and then, because mm -hmm. in the geocoding, we have the, it shouldn't be like north and then east, or it's flipped. What are the, here, the, the coordinates then? So these should, should be latitude and longitude coordinates. Exactly. Yeah, okay. you're right in the part of the world where the uh, latitude and longitude are almost exactly equal. Yeah, I know. Mm -hmm. That's funny. <laughs> but uh, yeah, okay. So I will so, just try to open it in uh, in ARC and we'll let you know. Okay? Thank really you. quick, really yes. quick. Can you guys hear me? Um, yes. I don't know if one of the others are going to comment on this, but just so you know, this particular earthquake is very hard to unwrap and the normal unwrappers are going to give you um, problems where it crosses the fault. It's just the, because the, a lot of happen out there. I mean, because if, of if you look at thing. the uh, yeah, if you look at the unfiltered interferogram, um, not the geocoded one, you're going to see that it basically goes to noise as it crosses the fault. So the unwrappers will unwrap it. They'll try to connect across, but they're going to get the wrong answer. And so um, a lot of people who are actually studying this earthquake 
have to go to a lot of extra steps to deal with that because it's such a big event that you have basically yeah. half of the frame is above it and half is below and there's nothing that connects to zero around it like you would for a smaller earthquake so yeah the unwrapper won't know how to connect your lower to your more northern portion so it means mm -hmm. that all the results are kind of this is the this is wrong yeah the unwrapper Probably. won't be correct it, it can't it, it's not possible yeah <laughs> Well, you always uh, that plot that you're showing is not not from an interferogram. That's from pixel offset tracking. Oh, what? Where is this pixel? The, the like, one you were showing earlier. In uh, the paper. The plot that you were showing earlier. Ah, here. Yes. Yes. This, this is from pixel offset tracking, not from interferometry. Okay. This is they have the something. Yeah. Like see this. how? That's the interferogram. Yeah, I know. I know. You just they can't get through have, that area. Here they have displacement. Yeah, that displacement's also from pixel offset tracking. Um, okay, well, will this count for a homework or do I have to find yes. another? <laughs> You've encountered many of the issues we would hope that you encountered. I mean, um, it took dealing so with long it, sorry. To process. I went through all the steps, but okay, um, interesting. That's the. Yeah, just okay. don't write a paper on it. Yeah. Like a special <laughs> case. Yeah, isn't it? My yep. luck. Okay. Well, thank you for time. And but okay, but okay, even if it's wrong that you so that's why the geocoding everything is like flipped and mess. No, I it, I'm I'm wondering if the lake you're pointing at is not actually the same lake. I've looked at this pair quite a bit, and there are other features, kind of dry lakes to the south of the fault that had liquefaction that have that shape. And so I think the one you were pointing at is maybe not the same one. Excuse me, one. Um, mm -hmm. I think you're the. It's somewhere in the vicinity of that arrow there. Okay, I will just pull in arc map and see how that looks like. Yeah, Thank I think you, you probably much. are in the right spot. Okay, great, great. Thank you again. <laughs> if you look at the very end of the tops app. Uh, notebook, there's a user exercise on doing the pixel offset maps, and you should run that on this earthquake, and you'll get much better results for the um, displacements. They call it dense offsets in ICE. Oh, I see. 3111. Uh, yes. And by the way, for that earthquake, although Sentinel-1 cannot unwrap it, and if you try the ALOS-2, which the data is actually publicly available, we're not we're not uh, exercising this in this class, but uh, IS-2 can also process that, and uh, it can unwrap there. Even the ALOS-2 data is challenging. Yeah. <laughs> Probably not for beginners. True. I spent a lot of time manually picking. <laughs> All right. So um, can I jump with a new question? Go for it. All right. I, I'm a newbie to even Python. So this, this has been slow uh, for me. Uh, I selected uh, through Vertex, a couple of uh, pairs uh, for the um, 2019 Ridgecrest earthquake. And uh, the best I've been able to churn out was getting the right data, but the DM kept, uh, the notebook kept downloading the DM for the older example. So I created a new directory, a new 2.2 tops data processing directory and started from scratch with all the subdirectories uh, clear. And I'm still having trouble downloading data. Um, so if I may share my screen here. Desktop three, share there. So this is my latest attempt where I have changed the uh, product number here 
I also changed the uh, apps, top app uh, XML to have the uh, coordinates for the region of interest. And I manually changed uh, the uh, reference. Oh, no, it's empty. How oh, interesting. Or you can change this stuff in the, in the code itself where we yeah. generate that XML for the top up. At first I did manually change the XML for reference and then secondary, but you can do this here if you go yeah. to, you know, where. Yeah, I, I noticed and that. It will generate you, you the proper one. The new ones. So it points yes. to top up. So here. No. Oh yeah, exactly here, yeah. Yeah, and I did change those. So, um, and yesterday I, I resolved the uh, NetRC issue. So, and earlier, last, well, last night I was able to download the right data in the previous directory, the original directory. So I don't know where I am going astray. Um, can you scroll down so we can see the bottom of that error? That's usually where yes. the board and stuff is. Cannot access local variable child. So that sounds like an XML issue to me. Okay. So I would check that the XML uh, that you created is a valid XML. No, it's not even there. might there. be a bit of a format issue. Oh, yeah, or non-existent. Yes. And so, uh, OK, here's the tops. So. The only thing that I did in the original XML was to comment out the, the original region of interest and created uh, a new region of interest entry with the adjusted coordinates. Can you go back and top zap to where you had edited the um, reference and where you actually had kind of that XML section there above? Right, 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 don't don't close it. Okay. Wasn't it no, I'm not even finding them here. No, I think it, I messed up royally. Wasn't it in here? Um, where above where you where you were talking about how yes you did edit it in the notebook as well. Yeah. So let me let me oh, uh was... let me start again. Uh, start my server. Okay, here it comes. Here's the original that I tried to do a bunch of stuff. And here's the new one. Uh, Insar, yeah, it disappeared. So I have to uh, create a new one. Um, yeah, yeah, sometimes when you restart your machine, it, uh, it downloads the original, um, files from, from Geosync. So if you want to uh, make your own uh, version of things, you need to change the file, uh, your uh, notebook name so that it doesn't get overwritten. With, but Because every time you restore it to your server, it, 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 it erases what you have and uh, down, re-downloads from the uh, GitHub. I'd recommend making a new directory in your home directory. Because I think yeah. that, so you're not, um, losing things when they refresh that whole um, notebook directory. So I don't put it in here. So I'm going to delete this one and restart. No, don't delete and, the, the, the it's, folder. It's just save, make a new directory in your home directory and put your work there instead. It'll be easier for you to keep track of it. So go up, um, hit the little folder near the top. Yeah. The, here's one. the home directory. Yeah. Make yeah. yourself a new directory and do it copy things there. Okay. So then I copy the top apps and all the content from the 2.2 .2 that is relevant. 
Yes. That's what you're suggesting. Okay. Yes. That, then you'll have a separate directory that the, the automatic download won't overwrite. Okay. L let me work on this and you can help other people so I'm not locking up the, uh, the, the office hours here. This happened to me too. I'm good with Python, but I'm not good with how ASF is handling all of these automatic things. Yeah, it's a, it's always a, a it's a trade off between making it sort of get the most recent versions, but then also keep what people are changing. It's a great system. It's just it takes a little bit getting used to. All right, I'll I'll silence myself for now. Let me work on this. Thank you. Somebody else with a question? Um, I don't have the chat. Oh, here's the what, chat. I'm looking at the chat. So is it, uh, I'll, I'll say it out loud so it goes in the recording. Is there a way to remove C areas from the image by assigning zero values to terrain without elevation, as in snap? Um, honestly, I just do this manually myself. So I don't know if there's any, uh, ice specific way to do that yeah ice has a, a way to uh, download a, a water body database uh, wbd but does it mask the data or does it just not um use it does it just use that info when it's unwrapping i think it's uh, yeah, the data the values. App does not do the masking I, I, right. so something that i've always found not that should be changed but i haven't figured out how to change it so I have um, thoughts on that. We can talk yeah. later. <laughs> also, sometimes sea level changes, so there's reasons to maybe leave some flexibility in there. Mariana, what are you trying to do with it? Is it just for visualization, or are you trying to speed up processing for like a small island surrounded by ocean? I guess while he's typing, because that's, it'll, you know, it depends on your use case. It's processing an earthquake near the sea. Um, so if there's a lot of ocean, um, it could slow down if you're trying to unwrap the ocean. I guess that would be the only way you'd get um, penalized. Um, the other suggestion, um, and I believe the notebook provides you a way to do this, but you can specify a bounding box that you want to do your processing inside of, and that won't mask out the water body specifically, but you can make a small bounding box that does not include the portion of your scene that is dominated by ocean and just actually process the burst where the deformation is happening. Now, another thing, if you want to play, um, yesterday, a few people pushed imagemath.py as a really useful tool to get to know. And you could do a lot of logical operations in that. So you could make, say, a mask where you're assigning thing. If you have something where you have zeros and ones, you could multiply your interferogram by that using imagemath.py. And that would at least set the phase values equal to zero there. There might be reasons not to do that, but um, that would be... You know, something it, it's a, it's a useful tool to learn how to use. And it has a pretty nice um, help statement if you just type it at the command line. Image, it's, I'm going to put it in there. It's lowercase image, capital M, math.py. Good morning, everyone. Sorry, I joined late today. But... Hi, Scott. Good morning, you. Scott. Good morning. Mariana, I was just going to say there's uh, this w, wbd.py as well that um, Eric mentions if you want to retrieve and create kind of um, these water mask files, then you have to use image math to up do something with those files against whatever else you're working with. But have a look at that as well. Yeah, that downloads a, a a water body database that uh, came was used for the SRTM data processing. It's pretty. It's quite good in most places. Uh, maybe not perfect. Good 
it gets to the data from the same servers as the SRTM data. So you, <laughs> you have to have the same NetRC set up. I had a question for the other instructors. Do any of you all know if there are plans to have TOPS in SAR? Is there a plan to build a TOPS in SAR esque workflow for ICE 3 or on top of ICE 3? Uh, ICE 3 does include a, a, a TOPS, a Sentinel 1 TOPS uh, processing because they're using it for Opera. Oh, okay, good to know. Uh, I don't know the details. Of, I haven't been part of the Opera uh, uh, developing uh, group, but uh, the, the yeah, Opera is using ICE three and they're processing Sentinel one data, so it's it's in there. Uh, I don't know, how, and they're starting to make products already. So the main roadblock for me adopting it has just been there's not really something like the stack processor, and that's all we use. So, but I've heard there is plans to add that in. For a lot of the ARIA workflows, you're basically generating the geocoded products and then working from there. And I, yeah, geocoded SLCs. So they so that could be your stack. Whereas if you want to be doing things at full resolution and radar coordinates, that's what the stack processor is good for. And we'll talk more about that on Friday. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to say that everything is fine with geo correction. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Apologize. It's just there is that area which looks almost like uh like that lake and got me confused. Absolutely crazy. The, but mm. yeah, thanks for patience. Uh, there were some really pronounced liquefaction features out there in areas that didn't look like lakes. In yeah, may, may I show you? Yeah. Sure. Yeah, so what region see? are you? Oh, sorry. Uh, what... That was the thing. That was the thing. Yep. So this is the recent Turkey earthquake, Scott. Okay. Yeah, which yeah. So that was the area which it got me confused from the uh, yeah, it does look very similar to the lake van. For the shape <laughs> because of kind of like the triangle. Ah, never mind. Okay. So it... Thank you for patience. <laughs> Amy's well, it's good to, know uh, how writing... to display in QG or uh, GIS. So I'm sorry Amy's... again. It's good to know how to just display the results in GIS. So you that's an important step to learn anyway. Um, I see Amy has a question that probably some others have about um, choosing a good target. Yeah, mine collapses often aren't the best thing because they're very localized. Um, sometimes there's, there's actually a really interesting mine related earthquake in um, Illinois that you can see, but um, generally those are hard. So I would say anything from a magnitude five to six earthquake is probably a reasonable target for people to look at. Um, anything in central California, you're gonna possibly see um, subsidence from groundwater withdrawal that could be interesting. Um, it's a pretty large scale signal, but it's a those interferograms are very nice to look at. But I would say a magnitude five or six earthquake on land is pro fairly, you know, it's gonna be your best bet. On land without have being under a rainforest. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and for the uh, for the homework also, um, you know, any result is fine. I think we can say too. If you want to share whatever results you're getting, we could have a look at it. And if it's really noisy, that's that's a result. Like that's okay. We could talk about why it's not working or. Um, some of the interferograms over yeah. Hawaii in the past couple of years have had um, over the Big Island have been very have had really large signals in them. Yeah, the uh, especially the dike intrusion and uh, eruption of the Mauna Loa last December is a really a uh, beautiful signal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and the, the upper part of Mauna Loa doesn't have any vegetation, so it's very coherent except where the lava flows have disrupted the surface. <laughs> All right, uh, if I may jump in back again. Um, so I created the new directory, put all the files in, edited them to have the, uh, the two track numbers and the appropriate 
um, coordinates for the region of interest. So let me share here. Are you seeing my screen? Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. With the, uh, there you go. Now I got the message. Okay, so um, here's the directory in in my home. Uh, the top saps at top sap has the new region of interest coordinates. I did not put any uncom uh, commented lines, and I have not added it the secondary and and the reference as um, the uh, so notebook is going to force it later. Yes, I was just going to say based on the little child thing it was saying at the problem my. my First guess was that you had the path to your data set incorrectly in the XML. So when you actually do look at your reference in secondary, um, make sure that the that it's actually finding those raw data files. But um, in in here, maybe it's in here. Yeah. So where yeah. wherever you're putting, no, not here because you need to actually have the one that points to the. Yeah. So I'm wondering how it makes that. Maybe the other um, teachers know what I'm talk, trying to say. Yeah. Like it has to have the, I think you, you're going to need the full path <clears throat> to wherever that raw data is sitting. Yeah. You uh, that's going to be later on. On your left, on your left side, open the reference to XML file and then check the path there. Yes. So, so this has not been downloaded yet, uh, but, oh, I see what you mean. Yeah, make sure that that really points where the data is. Okay. Because there was so some. Let me be... so if okay. You, if you want to go ahead and run those cells, Daniel, we could see if yeah, um, so, they should work. So let me just start here. Two, three. And then. That one you don't need to run. This is just for, yeah, for the default files. That's yeah. right. Okay. Now it's just going to take a while. Yeah, thirty-seven, thirty-nine. Uh, I'll I'll finish this this homework with this um, ridge crest, but then I just had an idea. I was just at Ashkia in Iceland a week and a half ago, and I'll do the the inflation there. See if we can detect that inflation. Um, okay, this is done. Uh, this is fine. These are the new data. Yeah, the, the dike injection uh, events in Iceland also have beautiful signals. Mm hmm Yeah. Yeah, the holiday in 2014-15 uh, has a, a beautiful dike signature there. I haven't seen the, the interferograms for that, but... Um, I've seen the DM, the, the delta in, in topography at, at the, uh, the feeder dike. Also the one uh, just last month. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> By the time we got to the volcano, the eruption had ended uh, the, the day before, but the folks doing IR still got quite a bit of data with the hot flow. Well, it is downloading. Then the next cell will, will show. And then we'll check the paths. Uh, yes, Pablo put a nice uh, interferogram in the chat. That's the uh, magnitude six, uh, six and a half earthquake in northern Qinghai. 
Too bad. Wow. That's my favorite one. That's so symmetric. Oh, yeah, beautiful. Cool. The fault uh, strike is almost exactly uh, uh, perpendicular to the radar swath. So that gives a very, uh, and it's a strike slip fault. Uh, so it, a vertical strike slip fault, so it gives a very symmetrical butterfly pattern. Anybody else with a question? There is one I'm in the chat. One. Yeah, I'm answering one. I'm putting some text in. It's about converting to geotiffs. If you have so something, there's a really useful command called GDAL translate that if you have the Earthscope INSAR um, environment already loaded in the terminal, you can use it at the command line. This is um, what I have, the way I do it rather than in a notebook. And so I'm putting in a command in the chat right now. Um, you would need to open a terminal and then you have to actually activate the environment. So, you know, source activate, or scope in SAR, whatever. And um, I think you just can do GDAL translate and then just the, yeah, you'll see in a second. But yes, I am answering that one. Um, so if you see what I wrote there, if you have any of the files that has a VRT at the end, the VRT has all the information that GDAL needs to take that image, that flat binary image that's just a whole bunch of numbers in a grid and turn it into another format. So if you type GDAL translate, the name of that file with the VRT extension and then some other new name dot TIFF, that tells it to turn it into a GeoTIFF. Um, that only will work with the geocoded files, because if you give it something in radar coordinates, it's going to turn it into a TIFF, but it doesn't know anything about the, you know, the Latin lawn. So it'll just give you a, a TIFF that's rows and columns rather than having any information about Latin lawn. We probably do this in one of the notebooks too, but this is how I do it. Yeah, yeah, if you want to normal. run a command like that in a notebook, if you just put an exclamation point in the beginning, as long as you have the path set up correctly, um, it'll work as well. And that'll that'll inherit whatever um, inv um, Python environment you've activated, right? Okay, mm -hmm. that was one thing I wasn't sure. Yeah, it'll run in whatever environment your notebook is in. Uh, there's a net RC question. Well, we haven't been talking about that today. I know some people had that were having problems yesterday have said that it was fixed. Have you already gone directly to the web page and tried to download data, which will force you to um, back to the vertex, the ASF web, web page? that'll force you to sign the data agreement? I guess uh, I'm yeah, it's, hmm? yeah what's yes, been but, happening is that you need to um, yeah. change the permissions on the NetRC file. Sometimes uh, when you restart your server, it changes the permissions. <laughs> so, uh, so you might have to re redo the chmod 600 uh, netrc uh, command again. That's um, I, I had that happen to me a few times. I had to redo the the chmod uh, change permissions change mode. I guess that stands for. 
That's a uh, Linux speak or Unix speak. Yeah, uh, I, I think this uh, one, uh, may, may I share my screen briefly? Uh, so I follow, uh, yeah, I follow the script here. And after following, uh, after executing this script, actually, uh, the uh, yesterday's assignment uh, ran for me successfully. So I, uh, uh, but yesterday during the lecture, uh, also suggesting like this, like CSMOT 600 slash uh, dot net, uh, net That actually does not work for me, but this one work for me. So I think this is the only thing I, I need to follow, right? Every time uh, I restart the uh, ASF. You should only have to rerun that last uh, chmod um, command because your file will still, that netrc will stay in your home directory. So every time you restart, it'll still be there. Yeah, you know, sometimes the permission gets reset. That, that happened to me at least once. Mm -hmm. It never. It doesn't hurt to rerun that command. Okay. Thank you. So anybody else have an a, a example they want to show from the homework last night? I guess we're going to do the full homework uh, discussion uh, at uh, later today, this morning. But anybody else that has a problem with getting the Tops app to run? Uh, Amy has a question about how to uh, display the misfit function. Um, you're using the um, you're using the uh, markdown uh, way of of uh, displaying the PNG file. Uh, that's uh, most of the notebook uh, that notebook uses the a different uh, way to display the file as part of the Python code using the uh, uh, what is it? Amy, in your um, HTML syntax, you may want to drop the last slash. I think that's a syn I think that may be a syntax issue. Yeah, you have to get the right. Uh, if you're going to use a markdown, you have to use the right uh, HTML syn syntax. I don't see a, an example here in the notebook that does that with HTML plot. Oh, 
Oh, right. Another thing. Uh, yeah, you the, the path also has to be correct uh, since you assume you're on the notebook, right? So I guess uh, you just need what? You just need lab six data starting from there, I believe. Drop everything in front of it, or you can add a, a full path. That also should also work. The notebook has a, a, a neat feature in the um, uh, the Jupyter Lab uh, interface. If you go with the file browser and uh, find your file, the, you can ask it to give you the full path to that file. So that for a purpose like this, where you want to have the path to the file, it'll. That's one of the uh, commands. If you right click on the, on the file name. <clears throat> I could show really quick an alternative to saving to GeoTIFF too. If, um, it seems like a couple folks had an interest in that. Um, maybe I'll put it in the Slack or Scope Slack. But since we're, for those of you learning Python, um, just another recommendation for how you might go about converting this to a different format. Um, it's pretty straightforward to do with um, X-Ray. So if you open, you know, uh, unwrapped Geo VRT, um, here I'm selecting the second band, which is phase from that file. So turning it into a single band and then outputting to GeoTIFF. So that's, if you want to stay in Python, sometimes it's confusing to go back and forth between terminal and Python when you're using it. Um, so that's another approach. I'll I'll put that code in the or scope Slack. Uh, somebody's using the uh, image math uh, command in uh, so the you uh, hmm. if you don't specify the output file format it's going to be in the standard ice format I mean, you can call it whatever you want but it's going to have be in the same ice format with it should create the whatever your file name is um, you, can, you can fix it with XML that. and dot, uh, dot yeah. VRT. Um, you don't have to have an, an equal sign. You can just say dash O and then the name space and then the name of your file. Um, and I always add the data format. So if it's complex, I would add dash T space C float. I don't know if that's absolutely re actually required though or if it'll figure that out on its own. So since this is, I assume, an unwrapped file, I would just say dash T float, but that probably is the default. Oh, and the other thing is that the um, the unwrapped phase uh, and the uh, unwrapped phase.geo files are um, two bands. They have one band that's the amplitude image and a second band that's the uh, unwrapped phase. So 
um, you actually want to uh, use only the bet you want to if you want to do the image math command, you have to try to make sure that it's only applying that scaling to the, um, I forget, let me see what the. I think it's system. here he would do, wouldn't he do A underscore one would give him the first. Yeah, A underscore thing. one, that's it. Yeah. Um, but then you're only outputting the unwrapped file um, with that scaling and won't have the amplitude as well which is probably fine. Now you have a one band file instead of a two band file. How to select that other band, only one? You're muted, Marini, Rowena. <laughs> I haven't done that for a while, but I think you would type underscore. And if there are two bands, the first one would be zero and the second one would be one. So underscore zero, but it says in the help. Let me look that up. Oh, another uh, quick visualization tip is if you're trying to look at any of the data sets um, before interferogram formation, a lot of them are in a complex data format. So there's a real and an imaginary component and a lot of um, GIS applications like QGIS and maybe ArcGIS as well will kind of balk at that and they won't open correctly. So you might not see any of your data when you open. But there is a neat trick with GDAL for getting only the amplitude or the phase component of a complex image. I'll post two example commands in there, but using the derived sub data set capabilities of GDAL Translate, you can actually just get the amplitude data set out. And that should display nicely in a, a GIS. It's neat. I didn't know you could do that. <laughs> yeah, the derived like sub data sets are kind of cool. Feature. I'll also <laughs> link to the help page. There are a few more, but those ones are really nice if you're dealing with um, complex data. You can also use it to do like a log amplitude transformation, which is nice. Looks like Mohammed has some results to show. Uh, from ALOS too. Yes, great. Can you hear me? I'm going to try to put that in the, in the course, but it's a it's, it's a little bit different program. But yeah, uh, I hope you work well. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, I'm sorry for the music behind. I am in the cafeteria. <laughs> so. So I think uh, I can. Let me share my screen. Okay. So my screen is visible. Yes. Okay, can like uh, I, I process the allows to data with the inospheric and without inospheric corrections. So it is at the uh, Indian and Eurasian collisional zone, uh, somewhere at the boundary of Iran and Pakistan. Yes. So uh, first, I uh, show some results. This was, I guess, without uh, any. Uh, Without any corrections, with the, with the, uh, with the, uh, number of loops with one and fourteen, and uh, it's it's <laughs> there is a earthquake. This deformation is is uh, earthquake. Maybe it is more visible in next some like this one. Yes, this region, but it still it's has a lot of. This is without ionospheric uh, corrections. So 
I use two pair of images, one on on eleventh uh, of uh, 11, 9, 20, 21, and the second one is twenty three ten twenty one. So, and uh, this is I think with with some uh, filtering, but without ionospheric directions. I also see, and this is unwrapped. Uh, Interferogram with the, without ionospheric reactions. Now I will show some results with the, uh, this one, I guess, with with ionospheric reactions. Sorry. This one. So there, uh -huh. there is a change. Uh, there is a change between this, between this and uh, this one but still has a lot of noise in this region also in this region i don't know why it is it's very noisy and also there are some if i zoom 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 in a bit more it looks like you have a lot of tropospheric noise in this uh, interferogram there's a lot of uh, <clears throat> phase that sort of correlate with topography mm -hmm. and that's an indication that it's tropospheric noise uh, and there are also some topographic signals as well. Like this, there is a change in the topography. If I go in more, more. So these, I suppose these signals are, uh, the green ones are due to the topography. I yes. try to, I try to use uh, multiple combinations of uh, range and azimuth looks, but it is not getting better. So yeah, there is a low topography and there is a change in the topography in this upper part and there is a i mean this this is a change in the topography in this region exactly in the same way so i can also show you the xml file the one i used i use almost a similar uh, almost a, a, the same as the default parameters like this one also but uh, but for the like, I, I just do like that, do ionospheric correction with two and apply ionospheric corrections. Uh, uh, these, these are two parameters I change, except all everything, uh, all others are the default parameters. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Uh, I, I did not change anything below. <laughs> I, I tried to change uh, and one thing I can show you. Uh, like here, I tried to change uh, number of loops with like uh, sometimes 14 and 18, but it takes, takes around like, uh, so, uh, it takes so much time that it, it, it doesn't finish. So I, I, I truncated the program and then change it again. Yes, um, Tops app, I mean, uh, ALOS 2 app has this uh, little bit strange way of uh, doing the looks. So normally for scansar data uh, you're, you, that you're processing, you want to keep the looks one equal to one range look and 14 azimuth looks, and then change the range, the uh, looks two parameters. So the default for looks two is five range looks and uh, two azimuth looks. But the, so the looks two uh, looks are multiplied by the, the for, the looks one looks are taken while the interferogram is being processed, and then uh, there's a second multi looking step that, that uses this looks two parameter, and that's why your final uh, interferogram was getting five uh, range looks and twenty eight azimuth looks because the two in this uh, looks two is multiplied by the the fourteen that was taken in the um, uh, the first. Uh, in, in the inter interferogram formation, uh, we don't the the fourteen uh, looks one is necessary because of the way that the ALOS two uh, scansar data is focused. And uh, we don't really have time to go into a lot of detail, but it's uh, you, you shouldn't you basically you should not change the looks one values. Only change the looks two values. 
so uh, so i can try to do with this uh, like uh, it should for the, in the in the chain should be in the number of range looks or also in the azimuth looks you you can change it, both of those values but the other thing to notice is that this line is commented out in the yeah, uh, XML. so uh, for this one is commented out but i tried that one i uh, I should yeah. change uh, something in the none, like uh, I should write. Yeah, change here. none to, uh, you could change that to two if you want. If you want uh, to get higher resolution, only yeah. take two range, range looks and uh, one azimuth look, it, that'll uh, give you a higher resolution. This It'll one, also like take this? a lot much longer to unwrap. It, it might You might run out of memory. It's, uh, it, yeah. it, it's a very large file. Yeah, it takes a lot of time as well. It's like if I run, I, I tried yesterday night it and it and in the morning I see it's it was still running. Yes, it can take hours to run because these yeah. are very large files. Yeah. So uh, how could we improve these results? Like there is also topography signal and also some uh mass break noises. Um, I don't remember. I tried uh, another combination, but then and then the uh, then the uh, uh, ionospheric noise was was increased instead of decreasing. But in this in this image, it is decreased. But I tried one combination. I don't remember now which one was that. And like it was like blue, full. This region was blue, so that means that it has increased the ionospheric. The noise. Yeah, I don't know. Something's a little bit messed up in your ionosphere correction. It's it seems like it's looking worse than the uh, data before the ionosphere correction. So in this particular case here, something is not working quite right in the ionosphere correction. Um, and there's no big ramp of uh, phase across the scene in you, before you do the ionosphere correction. So in this case, I think the ionosphere is uh, not not very strong, and you don't really need to do the ionosphere correction. But but the loss observations is less affected by tropospheric, right? Uh, there's no tropospheric correction built into ice. No, I mean loss to data is not very much affected. Normally, it is not very much affected by tropospheric effects because of L-band. Uh, the troposphere is exactly the same for L-band and C-band. It, it ends up being the same uh, the same uh, dis number of meters of de delay, path delay. Mm -hmm. that, oh. That's a uh, we you, by changing the radar wavelength, we don't get away from the troposphere. It, it stays the same, unfortunately. <laughs> it's that's part oh, cool. of INSAR. So I have to leave now. I have another meeting. Uh, okay, so we'll maybe discuss in the last hours that how could we improve this one. This one is before the uh, ionospheric correction. Yes, great. Okay, I thank you very much. Thanks, Eric. See you. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I guess we'll just have a few more minutes before closing the call. Did anyone have last easy please. question? I previously see Daniels uh, raised, raised uh, his or her hand. Yeah, so <laughs> I am still struggling a little bit. Um, and I haven't yet figured out if it's a path problem or, or what, but uh, by the time I get to uh, the pre-process, it, it fails to find the swaths. So there are no bursts to extract. Yeah, definitely double check your region of interest. Um, I would say for that, it's easy, easy to accidentally, you know, 
get your north and south switched or things like that. So. Okay, cool. I'll keep working on it. Thank you. Yeah, I've probably done that like 50 times. Everybody seems oh, to have I... a, a different order that they like to specify north, south, east, yeah. and west in too. Yeah, I did 50 times just this morning. <laughs> uh, <laughs> cool. Thanks. I, I thought I usually would um, just go to SAF website and then just make sure all the download file and then the bonding box are all checked or checking out, especially also the subsource number. If I'm not sure, I just put one, two, three, all in all, all there. Okay. Nine o'clock, guys. Um, should we go ahead and wrap up? Yeah. Yeah, people have a. We'll have another opportunity at the beginning of class today, I believe, to ask some questions. Okay. Good. All right. Thanks, everyone. Great. Bye. Bye.